<clears throat> Welcome everyone. Now we have the pleasure of um, hosting Professor Ana Maria Rey, uh, who's Gila Fellow as well as NIST Fellow and Professor Adjunct in the Department of Physics at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Professor Ana Maria Rey is a fellow, well, as I say, is a fellow Gila, as well as NISC fellow. Um, she received a um, BSc from the Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia, as well as a PhD from the University of Maryland. Between 2005 and 2008, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, after which she joined the faculty at Gila and the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, her talk is entitled Optical Lattice Clocks from Timekeepers to Spies in the Quantum Realm, and the talk is going to be held in English. Ana Maria, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Be welcome, and I pass the word on you. Great. Um, thank you so much. Good morning. I want to start this talk by thanking the organizer, Salvador, to the, for the invitations to speak today at this Latino, Quantum Latino workshop. And what I want to tell you today is what I think is the fascinating idea of how we can use atoms and light to create atomic clocks that are the most precise timekeepers that you have ever imagined. I'm going to try to take a look at, at the inner workings of atomic clocks. And hopefully I can convince you that atomic clocks are not only fascinating and useful, but very important since are, they are helping us to unravel big mysteries about the quantum world and hopefully to build the next generation of, of quantum technologies. So with that, uh, I want to start my talk by acknowledging my collaborators. Um, first, I want to acknowledge uh, the group of Junje. Uh, he's actually the clock maker. He's the one, his group is the one that does the experiments and take the measurements. So I want to acknowledge the great group of students and postdocs who, who, who will took the data that I will present. And of course, my theory group, uh, we were the ones that present the simulations and the calculations that I will discuss. Well, with that, uh, let me start uh, with the big idea of, of ultra cold atoms because this is the basis of, of our work. So remember that the temperature of a gas is a measurement of the average kinetic energy of the atoms in the gas. So if we're going to try to understand that, of course, we need a thermometer. Uh, and typically at room temperature, that is around uh, 300 Kelvin, um, then atoms are moving extremely fast in the air. Like they're kind of billiard balls colliding and at a velocity that is very fast, uh, almost the speed of sound. And therefore, it's very hard for us to control the atoms at these temperatures. And now if you ask you to uh, ask you to think about what are the coldest temperatures that we can naturally reach um, in the universe, you might think, oh, okay, the temperature of the outer universe. And that's right. I mean, uh, uh, and these temperatures can be of the order of a few kelvins. And if I can make a comparison with a, a cold gas, for example, this is the temperature at, at which helium atoms condense. Uh, and um, at this temperature, nevertheless, the atoms are still moving very fast, around 90 meters per second. So we cannot control them very well in the lab. So one of the biggest, biggest um, developments that we have made in the last few years is the capability to actually cool down uh, systems of 10 to the 4, 10 to the 6 atoms at ultra cold temperatures below uh, like a billion of a degree of a Kelvin and below, um, that means between 10 and 100 nano Kelvins, where the density of the system can be five orders uh, diluted, more, more dilute than, than the air. And at these conditions, the atoms are moving very slowly, uh, around um, a centimeter per second, and therefore um, we can control them. Uh, this has been a big joint effort that actually have been recognized with two Nobel Prizes. The first one was given to Steve Chu, Colin Tanoji, and Bill Phillips, um, and they used lasers to cool down the atoms by using the light. And under these conditions, they were able to reach temperatures of the order of micro Kelvin. But these temperatures were not enough, and there was a, Nobel, a second Nobel Prize given by to Eric Cornell, Wolfgang Ketterle, and Kai Wyman. Actually, Eric and Carl 
uh, white men were both at Gila, uh, and they were able to reach even further temperatures uh, or reaching 100 nano Kelvin by treating the atoms and evaporating them as you have a cup of coffee and the hot atoms escape and the cold remains. Uh, so this technique was used kind of effectively and they were able to create a new state of matter that is a Bose-Einstein condensate and this was awarded no Nobel Prize in 2001. So, but of course, I'm giving you, well, we cool the atoms and maybe you have been thinking, okay, so what we can do with ultra cool atoms? And one of the most exciting directions that I want to tell you today about is that they offer a tool for us to explore the quantum world. And what is exactly our goals? So we dream to use these atoms to build advanced synthetic materials. That means, for example, we want to use atoms in trap in potentials that emulate the behavior of electrons in solid state crystals, but in a much controllable environment. And for that, we should be able to actually build these materials with unique and properties. For example, we might be able to build superconductors that conduct at room temperature. This is not happening in, in real materials, or so there are many questions that we don't understand. So we want also to use these atoms to actually maybe lay, lay the foundations of a new type of computers, what is called quantum computers, that use quantum mechanical elements themselves and can be ultra fast and can reach have capabilities that is are not possible even with the most advanced classical superconductors that uh, supercomputers that we have nowadays accessible. So this is a dream and a potential big uh, technological development. Also, uh, we want to. Uh, shed light into many questions our our universe that we don't know and understand fundamental physics basically we want to connect the behavior of the microscopic world that is described by quantum mechanics with the behavior of the uh, macroscopic objects that are described by general relativity like black holes but actually uh, we don't understand how to unify these two theories so hopefully we can shed a light on that and finally, we want to build the most precise quantum sensors that we have dreamed about that can sense at a level that is impossible with classical sensors. And ultra cool atoms are open, opening a, um, a, a, um, a window for exploring all these possibilities. But in particular, I want to tell you today that in atomic clocks are one type of ultra cool atoms that are really powerful and hopefully can connect really to all these really exciting goals. Um, so for that, let me, with that said, I want to start by describing a clock. I mean, as for us, a clock is, is something very common. A clock is something that ticks in a regular and repeated manner, and we use this to measure time. So typical clocks are built with two ingredients, an oscillator that is the object uh, that ticks, what oscillates, and the counter that is what we use to count uh, the number of oscillations and keep that track of time. So in the case of atomic clocks, we also have these two basic ingredients. Uh, we have an oscillator, and in the case of the oscillator, is an electromagnetic source. It can be a microwave or it can be a laser. And uh, the, what we use to count the oscillations are the atoms. There are very powerful objects, and they, as I will explain in this talk, one of the important parts is that in the case of when we use lasers, a visible light, the ticking is so very fast that not even the most advanced electronics are able to keep track of these fast oscillations. But on the other hand, atoms can't. So there are a very good counter. And in fact, um, the fact that in the atoms, a quantum mechanics tell us that the energy levels are, 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 are quantized and are universal, that means are the same for identical atoms, so same here or in China, that's why, why the energy splitting of the atoms provide a unrivaled definition of the second and therefore as a, as a tool to determine time. In fact, um, actually since um, 1967, the definition of the second is by, based on the number of um, radiation cycles uh, uh, that uh, between two uh, uh, energy levels, hyperfine levels on cesium. So this transition had a specific energy, and this energy has a specific uh, frequency, 
and this frequency determines the number of uh, the number of uh, uh, light at this frequency. Uh, thinking at this frequency, it has approximately a nine p um, billion uh, periods of radiation, and during that, this determines the second. So it's the number of this number of, of, of radiation of associated with this atom. Um, uh, this definition was adopted in 1967. The first atomic clock was a cesium clock was actually built back in, in 1955. But and currently it's interesting, but uh, actually the cesium clock is not the best in the world. So we have better clocks and uh, the explanation is very simple. So if I ask you to compare these two rulers, ruler A and ruler B, and I ask you to, to think what ruler is more precise, then I think you are going to tell me, well, ruler B, because have more ticks and therefore I can measure things with high resolution. Similar happens for clocks. So it happens that the cesium clock, the energy splitting of the levels is, is, is gigahertz. So the, 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 the frequency of the, of the light that excites this transition is actually slower than the frequency that we can create, generate in other clocks that are called optical clocks that have the transition that is in the optical domain that is can be four or five order of magnitude larger than the microwaves. And therefore the light has a much faster ticking and therefore we can measure time in a more precise way because there are more, more, more oscillations uh, defining the, 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 the second. And um, so, uh, yes, so I'm going, this story that I'm going to tell you, in fact, is associated with these optical clocks. So I'm going to explain, and as I mentioned before, that the clock consists of the oscillator, that is in the case of a laser. We are using the atoms uh, to, 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 go, to count the oscillators as the counter. And for that, we are going to use a feedback cycle that I'm going to explain. So let me start by talking about the atoms. Um, in, I mentioned that we are using optical transition. Not all atoms are useful for this optical transition. The ones that are useful because of the atomic structure are atoms that have two outer electrons and this light in the second column of the periodic table uh, or some atoms in that have similar structure like ytterbium. But in this talk, our candidate is going to be strontium because it's the atom that we use at GILA. And in particular, we are going to use an isotope that is a fermionic isotope that actually has a nuclear spin larger than zero. I'm going to explain a little bit more about that. Um, so, uh, but the point is that uh, in strontium, we have the ground and the excited states that are going to be used for the clock. Uh, but if you uh, span out and zoom up, each of the clock states in principle is composed of 10 other levels, labels. But for the clock in principle, we can just isolate and use two. But for other things, many could be very interesting. All right, so yes, so we have these two uh, levels, the ground and the excited state. They are separated by an optical transition. And what is important for these atoms and why they are very useful for clocks is that this transition is both dipole and a spin forbidden dipole because it goes from j equal to zero to j equal to zero state, a singlet to a triplet. So in principle, these are forbidden. They are actually allowed because as I mentioned, there is a nuclear spins, but this that makes this transition ultra narrow. So the line width can be as small as millihertz. That means that an atom in the excited state can last for more than 100 seconds. So if, if you try to compare the, this, the quality of the atoms, like an, a, 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 a quality of an oscillator, just for, for simplicity, and you're trying to compute a, a quality factor, that is the ratio between the ticking rate and the damping rate, it would become larger than 10 to the 17. So it would correspond to a pendulum that when it starts to swing, it would swing during the entire edge of the universe without damping. That's the quality of these atoms. Of course, is not only the quality of the atoms because they are the ones that use to count the oscillations. We need to have a, a, be, a very good laser that can take advantage of these very high quality atoms. And this is what uh, has been, there, where there has been very, very important developments at, at GILA in Jones J Club that he have been able to generate lasers using very ultra stable cavities that uh, use, uh, that provide, that have generated coherence times that can exceed 10 seconds. So very, very useful uh, for, for this type of interrogation. And, and for finally, um, we want to avoid any systematics. 
And if you think what would be one of the worst systematics of, of, for measuring a, a frequency is motion, because if atoms are moving, you remember about the Doppler effect that depends on the velocity, you are going to feel different frequency. So in order to avoid Doppler shifts, what we do is we type, type the, uh, trap the atoms using light. So using two contrapropagating beams, we create an array like, like this, an array of pancakes. You can imagine that atoms are so deeply trapped that initially we will not allow them to move from one pancake to the other. And because the laser is perpendicular to the pancakes, so to this motion, so because it's frozen, then we avoid frequency shifts or Doppler shifts. The only uh, motion is perpendicular to the laser that doesn't matter. Uh, and we also avoid um, any, um, we design this trapping such that the trapping is identical for the ground and the excited state. They don't feel different trapping frequencies and therefore we avoid any star shifts. So that means we can avoid any systematics uh, for the tra confinement and we trap the atoms and keep very good um, a, a signal to noise without error. Um, in order to lock the atoms and to do the feedback cycle, what we typically use is, is a protocol that is called Ramsey spectroscopy that was first proposed by Norm Ramsey. He got the Nobel Prize in 1989. And the idea is very simple. If I have a ground and excited state, and I want to measure the transition or lock a laser with frequency omega laser to the transition of the atoms, omega zero, what I can do is that I prepare the atoms in the ground state and first I apply a very strong pulse that couples the ground to the excited states. This pulse is characterized by a detuning that is the difference between the laser and the trapping frequency uh, the, and the atomic transition frequency. Um, so the basic idea is that um, in, this is represented a block sphere that is the state of the atoms is the arrow points down means that the atoms are in the ground state in the arrow points up the atoms are in the excited state and when the arrow points in the in the equator we have a superposition between the ground and excited states so what happens is we apply a very strong pulse that can describe mathematically at an sx operator that means uh, generates a superposition between the ground and the excited state and the, this depends on the time that i apply that is called the pulse area that is set by the rabi frequency at the time i can rotate my 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 block vector perpendicular to the sx in this case for the x direction and uh, um, and generate the superposition that i want uh, as i said the number of excitation fraction is determined by this angle theta. Here, if I said the theta is equal to pi half, I create a the state in the equator with equal superposition between up and down. So here is the state that I create uh, after the pulse. And then I would let the atoms evolve uh, at, that, at that. We turn off the, the laser, but in the rotating frame of the laser that was set this pulse, the atoms are going to process uh, or acquire a phase that is determined by this detuning, by the energy difference between the laser and the transition. And this is what we want to measure. So this accumulated phase uh, that the atoms are acquired because of the different uh, in energy splittings. And this phase I can read by a second pulse that trans, um, uh, converts this phase accumulated into populations. I can measure the population of the atoms this has information of the of the detuning, and therefore, if I plot it versus the detuning, I get an oscillatory pattern that that or a face of some fringes that give me information of, of my locking, how much I'm locking my atom to the clock, and also I have a contrast that I want to have been as maximum as possible to avoid to measure as long as I can. So this idea is, 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 is how I'm looking. And this idea in principle where works fantastic for non-interacting atoms, where the more atoms that I have, you can see that here I have a signal that depends N, N is the total number of atoms. So the more atoms I trap, the higher the signal, that is great. The problem, uh, so in that case, I, I have uh, the ratio between the signal and the noise scales like a square root of N, and therefore the more atoms, the better. But importantly, and atoms nevertheless are not ideal particles. I mean, I mean they, they, are, they can collide with each other. They cannot pass through. And because they collide, what happens is that the collision can modify the ticking rate of the laser. So it changes the energy splitting in a way that depends on the density. And this is really bad. So we want to avoid as much as possible the detrimental effects caused by collisions. 
And that was one of the ideas that Jung had in order to suppress that undesirable collisions, we are going to use quantum statistics. And in principle, we, can, we are going to use atoms that are fermionic. Why? Well, when we describe collisions in quantum mechanics, everything you know that in quantum mechanics things are quantized and in particular collisions. So the collisions can be described in the relative coordinates of the atoms by, a, by an angular momentum L that characterize the, the, the different partial waves that participate in the collisions. So L, um, especially at very cold temperatures, what happens is that the atoms approach each other and then collide and back when in infinity after, after the collisions, the, because of conservation of energy and probability, the only information about the collision is a phase shift in the wave function. So this phase shift delta depends on the partial wave or the angular momentum and is characterized by some universal parameters that only depends on the on the on the uh, L. So if I have L equal to zero, that is the, the S wave collisions, this uh, the phase shift is just characterized, characterized by single parameter that is the scattering length. If I have L equal to one, that is the P wave collision, the next level of collisions, I have the collisions are characterized by a scattering volume, as you can see here, because I have two L. So basically, if you have a, because we have atoms in the ground and the excited states, in principle, I can have three different parameters, ground, ground, excited, and ground and excited. Um, and in, uh, the important part is that uh, these um, P wave collisions have uh, an effective potential that is suppressed by a centrifugal barrier. That's not the case for L equal to zero. And therefore, if I have only P wave collisions, they are going to be suppressed because the barrier can be of the order of 30 micro kelvins, whereas the temperature of my system is much more lower. For example, we have temperatures below one micro kelvin. So initially, um, the important point is that for fermions, Pauli exclusion principle forbids the collisions with L equal to zero. Identical fermions cannot collide because or in L equal to zero channel because Pauli statistics. They only uh, they are, can only collide via the P wave channel and because it's suppressed, because it costs energy, we were hoping that we can suppress these undesirable collisions by operating with fermions at ultra cold temperatures. But unfortunately, that was not the case. The clause was so precise that even if we operating with fermions back in 2008, the second largest system, a systematic of the error, when it was at the level of 10 to the minus 16, were coming from collisions. So definitely we need to understand the interactions in the clock. And that was where theory comes and makes an important contribution. So imagine my atoms, remember one of the pancakes in the lattice, uh, atoms are moving in this lattice, but the important part is that we have this centrifugal barrier that makes the collisions very weak. So remember that, uh, I mean, this um, um, pancake uh, energetically can be understood as having the atoms confined in an harmonic oscillator trap. So, and if you remember your quantum mechanics, if you have particles in an harmonic oscillator, the energy levels are quantized and, and equally split. So, and if we have, if we have a cold gas, but it's still some thermal components, the atoms are going to uh, occupy the different uh, energies uh, in the state. The important part is that the energy splitting between the levels can be of the order that is set by the trapping frequency, can be set, is set of the order of 500 hertz, whereas the energy, interaction energy of the collision is, is very small, is of the order of hertz or below, because the scientific are, centrifugal barrier. So we are in the regime where the collisions are so weak that they cannot make the atoms change the internal levels. In the, instead, the collisions, what happens is that the only ones that are allowed are the ones that are can switch the internal level from up to down between two atoms, but the motional levels remain unchanged. So that means that we can visualize the atoms as being frozen in these single particle energy modes. So the atoms are frozen in this uh, lattice in energy space. And the only thing that can change in this, their, these internal levels. So that means that we can write the dynamics in terms of a spin model that ignores motion, but the only matters is the spin. So more importantly, even though 
the collisions are contact because atoms are just going to see each other when they bump into each other. In energy space, something that is localized in position is the localized momentum or in energy, and therefore the interactions in this delocalized energy basis that form the lattice is almost collective, it's all to all. Almost one atom is going to interact with any other atom because they are delocalizing this uh, energy space. And therefore, uh, we can treat the atoms instead of looking at an individual atom. I can look at the sum of the total spins and I can write a large collective spin. Uh, here, SC, for example, is the difference uh, in population between the excited and the ground state. And remember, when we go back to the Ramsey spectroscopy protocol, this was set by the first pole of the laser. That's it. And it's constant, constant during the dynamics. So this is set by the first pole. So during the evolution, that is what matters, we can rewrite. Uh, and uh, the, 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 instead of having only the detuning, interactions are going to add an additional terms in the Hamiltonian. That is, they are the form of a C square and a C. These chi and C are interaction parameters. Remember, error is the number of particles in, in my pancake. And, and what happens is that if we do a mean field approximation, the effect of this C square term can be factorized. And we have an effective detuning that is not only the one that I had before, but is modified by, two th by uh, another term that depends on the P wave interaction parameters the excitation fractions, very importantly, uh, and of course, the number of atoms. And with this very simplified model, then actually we see very good agreement between the theory that is the solid uh, dash line and the experimental points. We were able to determine the parameters and moreover operate at a position where the shift because of interactions is canceled. And therefore we were able to advance the, st the stability uh, of, and the uncertainty of the clocks. Um, at this point, still we have we were operating in a deep lattice. We were we have undesirable un inelastic collisions between atoms in the excited state. So it was not perfect. But that using that, we were able back in 2014 to actually improve a clock that was about 1,000 times better than the current cesium standard. So that means uh, we had we reached a fractional frequency uncertainty of 10 to the minus 18 that corresponds to a clock that neither gain or lose one second in some 15 billion years, probably the issue of the universe. That's how a, a very good clock we were able to build. But that is not even enough. So I'm happy to report that since then up to this year, we have been able to improve the clock for a three order of magnitude more, and we have a reaching a sensitivity of 10 to the minus 21. And I'm going to tell you a little bit how we were able to do that. So for that, what we allow the atoms is to move and to generate what we call a spin orbit coupling. So basically, uh, you can see this of the optical lattice before atoms were completely frozen. Now we are going to allow the atoms to tunnel, but the important part is that because this is an optical transition, the face of the laser that illuminates the atoms is going to change from one lattice side to the next. It's going to be different because K time A, A being the lattice spacing, can be of the order of two pi. So when atoms move from one to the other side, they want to feel this differential phase. So basically, if I visualize the ground and the excited states as two, as two uh, legs of a ladder that there are connected via tunneling, and then they, uh, the laser can excite the ground to an excited state. In this way to visualize things, you can see that I start in lattice side one, I absorb a photon with some phase associated with lattice side one, then an I tunnel from one to zero, no phase. I emit a photon from, from the excited state to the ground state, but the phase here is different than the other because there are different lattice sites, and then come back by tunneling, I accumulate a next phase, phi, that is non-trivial, and that can emulate and give rise to an spin orbit coupling that is, is actually very interesting aspects for quantum simulation. And we were able to really fully understand this effect of a spin orbit coupling in our system. So, but the problem is that when we add interactions I mean, in a more dense system, the fact is that the face of the laser is going to be different from one pancake to the other. And therefore, when atoms are going to tunnel, 
they are going to find that the other atom is in a different internal state. They become distinguishable and not only open to P wave collision, but S wave collisions that are very strong. So that was very bad. Spin orbit coupling was bad for an horizontal lattice. And what we did is to bring gravity to the rescue. So what we did was we were able to actually um, a use a, instead a vertical lattice and use gravity to prevent these bad effects. And the basic idea is that when you have gravity that is acting along the vertical direction, in this case, it's drawing along the horizontal direction, but of course it's vertical, but I mean, if from one lattice side to the other, there is an energy cost that is MGA due to gravity. And what happens is the eigenstates of an atom in this tilted potential, it consists of localized wave functions, Warner functions, but with weights that make them much, much more localized than what happens in the lattice where completely horizontal. So I can control the degree of localization and I can operate in a lattice that is relatively not very deep, but I still keep my wave functions localized. So then what we were able to do is to use the interplay between gravity and spin orbit coupling and interactions to actually uh, control the clock better. So that means we have, because of the degree of localization, we were able to operate at shallow lattices while suppressing undesirable motional decoherence because the atoms cannot move too much. Moreover, the weaker confinement reduces the local density and suppresses detrimental peak wave in elastic losses. But moreover, we were able now to use the spin orbit coupling and the gravity to cancel the interplay between S wave and P wave interactions and operate at more better conditions. So very quickly, because I think I'm running out of time, we have uh, the atoms now they are localized, not in harmonic oscillators, but also in, our, in Warner Stark states that are the eigenstates of the gravity plus lattice potential. And the Hamiltonian that I have before now have a sum over M, different over almost different lattice sites. And we have a term that is the interaction on site that I described before. But now we have, because we have a little bit of, of a, the localization, a little bit, we can have also nearest neighbor interactions that are S-wave because the atoms between different sites are distinguishable because there is the spin orbit coupling phase that makes them distinguishable. So if, if I is equal to zero, of course, the no S-wave interactions, I have to be finite. But the important part is that if we combine these two terms, we can have a net term that has the conditions that I have before plus another term. And I can play with the lattice depth and make these two terms completely cancel. So as a function of the lattice depth, these are experimental data. And this is the frequency shift or modification of the ticking rate of the clock because of interactions. We can see that across a, a lattice depth that around 10, Micro, um, train recoils, we were able to cancel out the density shift. Uh, and actually in the experiment, this density shift was being able to reduce at the 10 to the minus 21 level. Uh, and it enhanced coherence time between the two parts of the cloud to 37 seconds. Why is that good? Because we were able to improve the clock by understanding many body physics and vice versa. And in fact, you might remember that Einstein told us that clocks at a different rate, at a different height, tick at a different rate because rate because of a, a curvature of a space time. This is called a gravitational rate shift. For the case of the air, the, the I mean the gravitational rate shift it can be written as a, a g, the local gravity, h, the distance between the clock, and c is the velocity of light for the, for the parameters of air. A, dis, a density a distance of one millimeter corresponds to 10 to the minus 19 difference in frequency shift. It, it was measured before at least, but here we were able to measure for the first time the gravitational rate shift between two parts of the sample that are separating at a millimeter scale. And this result was reported in Nature uh, last year. So that was very exciting. We were able to measure the gravitational redshift for the first time. And I'm going to conclude my talk now. I hope that in the future, we can all not only uh, use improved clocks to make them entangled, 
to actually start to explore these measurements of gravitational redshift to even explore larger physics. And I didn't have to tell you about how we can use these clocks as quantum computers, but if you can ask me, I can tell you a little bit more details. Sorry, I'm drawing late. So with that, let me thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, um, Ana Maria, for this great talk. It, it's been a, a terrific run tour on theoretical and experimental modern physics. So we do appreciate um, you sharing with us um, what you have done in your group. And uh, now we have to move to the next session. So I thank you very much and see you around. Okay, perfect. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks, bye-bye.